Good evening and kia ora from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm Dillis Johns from the University of Auckland and tonight I'm going to talk to you about wet sites and wet organic conservation and in particular how wet organic conservation has helped us interpret the past for waka and construction. And after I've spoken, Professor Jeff Irwin, also from the University of Auckland, will use some of the conservation projects to interpret navigation and walker construction. We'll focus particularly on 15th to 19th century walker, which I've directed conservation for in satellite facilities around the country. So even though much of the information discussed here is published and in the public domain, Providing context for the last 30 years or so of my work with Māori or iwi to conserve their cultural heritage is important as the main focus of my career has been to work with them to provide a positive outcome. I thought I'd put this slide in just to orientate ourselves. And we're down here at the bottom of the world. The Pacific Ocean covers about a third of the world's surface and Polynesians have been navigating this ocean for thousands of years. So Aotearoa, New Zealand, the last significant area on Earth to be settled by humans. Um, long, slender country runs from 35.5 south to 47 south latitude, and it's generally accepted that Māori, the indigenous population, arrived here around 700 years ago. So a brief timeline of conservation at the University of Auckland. In 1979, a purpose-built conservation lab was completed in the anthropology department. Really, it was to complement wet site investigations for staff in the department. And one of these investigations was Kohika. And Kohika was excavated and investigated over a long period of time from 1978 to 2008 by Jeff Irwin. In 1986, I returned from overseas study to the University of Auckland and started to develop conservation facilities there. And we quickly realised that there was a demand for conservation outside of the department and requests were coming from iwi and archaeologists and museums nationwide. This expansion of the services continued and resulted in setting up satellite facilities around the country to include at-risk collections that were too large or too fragile to travel to Auckland for conservation. In addition, iwi would prefer that their taonga or their artefacts are kept at home for conservation, and that was the main reason why I set up satellite labs to conserve their canoes or waka so that they could stay at home and be kept warm by their people. Over the last 12 years, I've set up 10 off-site conservation facilities around New Zealand, and I currently direct conservation in the University of Auckland Laboratory and five satellite facilities. Wet sites in New Zealand. So wetlands are found throughout New Zealand um, in a variety of different places, swamps, lakes, rivers. They can be permanent or temporary, salt or fresh water. Um, Buxton believes that only 10% of the wetlands that existed prior to European arrival still exist and that there is a um, marked regional depletion of wetlands. So, so some areas such as Taranaki, which is, is intensively farmed, their wetlands are almost completely gone. Now, for New Zealand... Organic material was really important um, pre-European contact. There was, of course, no ceramics and no metal. And so organic material played a really important um, part in their everyday lives. And uh, wood, wood, in particular, played a really important role. And this is reflected in their um, skill, not only in their carved artworks, but their domestic and horticultural implements, their waka, their canoes, their houses, their fibre work, you know, their cloaks, um, 
In fact, it's been estimated that about 80% of um, a pre-European assemblage would have been of organic material and therefore perishable. And so despite the um, obvious value of fibre and wood and organic materials, those, these sites are poorly represented in New Zealand and in the archaeological record. And the reason for this is mainly because those wetlands have been drained. So recent legislative changes in Aotearoa New Zealand have made quite a lot of difference for us for conservation and archaeology. And these are some of the acts that have, have been put in place over the last few decades. But they all state in different ways that Maori culture, historic, spiritual and physical values must be considered in land use, social planning and conservation. And that needs to happen before the work starts to take place, not once it's underway. And in order to facilitate this, um, memorandums or understanding are, are signed before the work begins. So that cross-cultural engagement is really important in Aotearoa in New Zealand and recognition of Māori authority, iwi authority, and um, recognising um, tikanga Māori or their protocols and customs as we work. It's really firmly established that iwi must be involved in the interpretation, study and protection of their tanga. Um, associated with archaeological investigations and, and just find spot recoveries. So here we are, this is um, a, a project in Taranaki where we're signing a memorandum of understanding prior to starting work. Another important aspect of working with iwi um, is understanding how they see artefacts or tonga. They're not just things, they're not just objects. Um, although, of course, they are as well. And a Māori academic, Paul Tapsell, I think, explains it really well here, that Taonga are time travellers that bridge generations, enabling their descendants to ritually meet their ancestors face to face. So they are, Taonga are ancestors, and there's another spiritual aspect to um, looking after them when they're recovered from sites. So this little boy here is standing by a waka kereru or a pigeon snare which is arriving from the South Island um, in New Zealand for conservation at the University of Auckland. i just put this in to give you an idea. It needs updating really. But you can see that the location, there are many locations um, where I've had conservation projects throughout New Zealand and throughout the Pacific. Um, not so much in, in the Pacific, but um, definitely around New Zealand. And we're getting more and more um, projects in the South Island as time goes on and development goes on. So this is the conservation lab currently at the University of Auckland. And as I said before, um, our clients include iwi, museums and other government heritage agencies. So, of course, um, analysis for archaeological materials has changed a lot over the last 20 years, particularly here in New Zealand. We no longer rely on results from European and North American experiments as we used to. And I have a large comparative collection of endemic wood species that were used by Māori for different functions. And we use these to protect treatment because we're not, it's not permitted to take samples off artefacts or tonga. We do take samples with permission from iwi from large objects such as waka or canoes. And for conservation treatment, still um, the most current dependable treatment and research method really is uh, treatment with polyethylene glycol and we bulk with, uh, with polyethylene glycol or PEG followed by freeze drying. I made up this comparison of different um, waterlogged wood treatments one time when I was trying to figure out what, 
what if we should be doing something different. And of course, there's always a playoff between rapidity or you know how fast the treatment is, and um, reversibility, um, expense, or and or specialised equipment. And so we've stayed with um, polyethylene glycol or PEG impregnation. Now we'll look at six different projects for waka conservation throughout New Zealand that I've directed. We'll start off with the Mukamuka waka, which is at the bottom of the South Island in New Zealand, and then move to the Hutt River waka, which is just outside the capital city of New Zealand, and then to Mridawai, which is a waka or a canoe just outside of Auckland, the largest city in New Zealand, and then we'll look at the Waikato Delta Waka and the Anawaka Waka and Papua Nui Wakas. Jeff and I have written a paper on these waka and um, it's yeah. printed in the Journal of Pacific Archaeology if you'd like to read it. So to begin with, collaboration and diversity. Of course, no two projects are the same, and they need constant uh, re-evaluation throughout the process, which is several years. New challenges regularly emerge, and frequently we have to change tack depending on what's available and um, when it can be brought to the site. And components of this collaboration or the success of a collaboration usually requires many different aspects, including um, heritage agencies, iwi being on board, volunteers, other prof heritage professionals, builders, architects, engineers. In addition, of course, we need a realistic timetable and um, a commitment to seeing the project through to the end. In fact, one of the first questions I usually ask Iwi is, what would you like the outcome to be? Where would you like your walker to end up and how and how would you like it displayed? So collaboration is very important. The first one that we'll look at is in the Southland, in Southland, right at the bottom of the South Island. It was found just outside of um, the local town in Vercargum. And to begin with, just one section was excavated by an archaeologist. And we decided to display it whilst it was being conserved. So we built tanks and displayed it in a gallery. And it was very popular. It was a very popular display. In fact, one of the people that saw, one of the visitors that saw the display said that he thought that he had the other piece of the waka. And I must admit we were a bit sceptical. But um, we went to his shed and yes he did have the second piece so then we expanded our display and um, conserved both pieces in the gallery this project has now been finished um, but it was control dried in its um, bespoke cradle in in the container that it was um, impregnated in The Hutt River Walker. This section of a walker was found four metres down in a river just outside of Wellington where they were digging for a new substation. So it's a section of a walker that is not complete, a rough out or under construction. It's 3.4 metres long and very robust, very, very wide and chunky. And we've laser scanned it and it's bilaterally symmetrical. Its date is 491 BP, so a couple of hundred years before Europeans arrived in New Zealand. So impregnation and drying of this walker is now complete and an appropriate venue is currently being sought to display the conserved walker section. The Murawai Walker, which is, was found about an hour out of Auckland on a hot iron sand beach in the middle of December, 
is about 7 metres long and 0.65 metres wide. It's made of kauri, one of the very favoured um, timbers for waka or canoes. And inside it has a square shaped step, which we think is interesting because it was possibly for a mast. And this indicates, of course, that they were still sailing. So when Tasman and Cook sighted New Zealand, they saw sailing waka or sailing canoes. Um, but over time, sailing became less favoured and paddling was um, used. By the time Europeans settled New Zealand, sail, sailing was seldom seen. Sailing waka was, sel was seldom seen. So this waka was a very light, slender canoe, which probably had side strakes or side pieces which um, increased the freeboard. And here we are um, scanning, uh, 3D scanning the walker outside because we didn't have a venue inside. So hence the um, spiderweb looked, look to make sure that nothing moved as we were working. So now this walker has been dried and it's been relocated to Ngāti Whaito or Kaipura's offices where it's um, currently behind a glass barrier and they're going to build a special storage and display menu for it. The Waikato River Delta Waka was found um, again in iron sand which poses problems with um, with peg impregnation. Um, here you can see the, the profile of this waka. Uh, it has quite a rounded profile but there is a v-shaped underwater aspect to it. Um, and here, this image here shows us um, bringing the walker into um, to the shore using a whale pontoon, which is really helpful because it's soft but very strong. Um, this is a, a, a river walker. It has very um, narrow, finely worked, smooth hull walls to um, go through the river quickly. And... Um, Bulking is now complete and we're getting ready to, to um, find a venue for storage and display. So these images um, shows a section inside the walker and um, the bath that we made to do the impregnation in. And we erected a fence around it because it was close to a park and we were worried about interference. So moving to Papua Nui Inlet and on the Otago um, Peninsula is where the Papua Nui Waka was recovered, along with many associated um, artefacts or taonga. Um, this area has lots of sites that are eroding from out of the bank and into the sea. And you can see on the map below, there's quite a lot of fine spots and sites along the coast here. It's actively an actively degrading coast. The section itself, the walker section itself, was quite unassuming to begin with. As you can see here, we're looking at it next to the range pole. We could see that there was a little bit of a bit of a curve to the piece of wood, and probably there the was a canoe section there, but we didn't think it would be much more than a meter long. So two days later, we were still digging um, at right angles to the sand dune and we'd got up to five point something metres after the second day and continued into the bulk, into the sand. So this waka was in an area of the Yellow Eye Penguin Trust and we weren't allowed to take a truck into the site as we'd disturbed the wildlife. And so it was decided again to use a whale pontoon and wait for the tide. So we um, blew up the whale pontoon, waited for the tide, and then slowly pushed the walker section into the sea and strapped it onto the walker. And walked it along the inlet um, to a place where we could easily take it out. And we made a temporary, ta a temporary tank for the walker to put on the um, Kamato of the chief's farm, and we left it there with um, fresh water overnight.
So here's the um, completed treatment tank and shelter that I used at Otaku MRI. This is where the polyethylene glycol impregnation was completed. And control drying of this walker will commence early in 2022, also on the MRI. So this walker is um, 6.33 long, metres long and 0.65 wide. It's quite unusual in that it had these uh, a ledge down one side. And luckily with 3D scanning, we were able to see that there was a flare on the other side and that it was um, bilaterally symmetrical. So preliminary findings for um, the Papua Nui Walker and Jeff will talk to you some more about this is that it's, it's a dugout canoe. Um, we don't have both ends, unfortunately. It is a moderately V-shaped underwater cross-section, and the outrigger nearby suggests strongly that, um, that they were sailing here as well, not just paddling. So this is the outrigger or float section that probably was used for the Papua Nui Waka, and you can see clearly the... Um, attachment holes, boom attachment holes on the bottom image. Papua Nui Inlet would have been a good location for coastal settlement and access to the ocean very easily. You can um, be out into the ocean over the bar and this would have been very good for um, sailing. And one of the other aspects at, Papua, at the Papua Nui excavation was fibre work. So fibre work was found both inside the hull and underneath the hull. And, of course, it's much shorter lived than the trees that you make walk around. So it's a lovely dating um, material to be able to use. And the dates ranged um, at Papua New from 440 BP to 463 BP. So a little, a little bit earlier, the Anaweka Walker. So this Walker Strake was recovered on the northwest tip of the South Island, just above the Anaweka Estuary. So, so here's the Anaweka Estuary on the left. As you can see, it's a, a wonderful place for resources and shelter, um, very sheltered for Walker. And on the right is the log jam in front of which the Anaweka Waka strake was recovered. So it was deep in that sand dune in the front of the log jam. This is a very remote um, beach on the west coast of the South Island, and they have some very wild storms there. And it was after one of these storms that the Anaweka strake was recovered and um, taken into the, the local town. So here's the Anaweka Walker Strake. It's made of matai. It's just over six metres long. It's a complete piece with lashing holes around its whole perimeter. It has a long stringer down the centre of the strake onto which fittings were lashed and four ribs that um, help keep the shape, the rounded shape, rounded profile of the strake. There's quite a lot of evidence on the main stringer of reuse, of reusing the lashing holes and digging into the hull. So um, Jeff and I have written a paper um, about this walker and it's um, published in the PNAS if you would like to read it. Analysis of the wood of the Anaweka Walker Strake revealed that there were large areas, large sections that are in an advanced state of degradation, particularly on the gunwales and on the ends and inside some of the large cracks throughout the length of the Walker Strake. In addition, Teredo worm evidence throughout it was, is seen throughout its length, and this indicates, of course, that the Wood has been in and out of an anaerobic environment um, prior to its recovery.
in all, this Walker Strake has probably had quite a hard life on the West Coast Beach on the South Island. So some of the progress or process of um, documenting the Anawaka Waka, we did um, 3D scanning um, right at the beginning to document the Waka. Um, and here we are in a disused cement shed scanning the waka. We had a bit of trouble um, with this waka because unfortunately waterlogged wood is very shiny and black and um, we had to get some acid-free tissue from a local museum and spread it over the surface of the waka to, um, to get a, a good signal. It always makes me laugh when I look at this picture because we had an iwi member helping us put the acid-free tissue onto the surface of the waka, and apparently he went to the pub that night and said to his friends, those people are quite weird, they spent all day putting cigarette papers on the waka. One of the striking features of the Anawaka strake, apart from its construction, is this turtle motif which is on the side of the waka. Turtle designs are quite rare in Māori uh, material culture. There are only four turtle amulets in museums um, around New Zealand, and we think um, that this turtle possibly relates to the ancestral Pacific connections to the waka and, um, and to the age of the canoe. So here, here's the turtle relief. Um, it's about three, 300 millimetres by 400 millimetres maximum. And the tail um, is, is, in, is, is raised and goes right out to the end of the strake where the lashing holes are. So this is a, reconstru a schematic reconstruction of the Anawaka Waka, showing where we think the strake would have been lashed into the side of the waka. So Anawaka, unlike um, the Māori canoe that we know and love, is not a, a dugout waka. It's a waka of many pieces which were lashed together. And this is an image that you've seen before of the Anawaka waka strake lashed into place on, on an artist's impression um, of what the Anawaka Waka may have looked like. It's been named by the Yiwi as Te Fao O, which means towards the light or enlightenment. So in summary, our current thoughts, canoes conserved to date over the last 30 years are starting to fit into an emergent time frame for early canoe manufacturer changes in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And um, our current results suggest that Aotearoa's earliest migrants adapted very quickly to their new environment using endemic timbers and modifying their existing canoe manufacturing skills to facilitate continued offshore sailing. Thank you for listening. And most importantly, special thanks to the following iwi and professionals who've helped with the production of this talk. Thanks. Um, Dillis's work is the sailing performance of archaeological canoes. This is a collaboration of archaeology, conservation and engineering and in this picture is one of our model canoes in a wind tunnel at the yacht research unit where Richard Flay has been the director and he's been um, our partner in this um, this research. When Europeans arrived in the Pacific they saw some amazing and sophisticated canoes sailing out on the open sea. There's been a long debate about how they navigated without instruments or maps, but it's now agreed that they could work out longitude from stars and they could fix the position of new islands by dead reckoning from known ones.
But a second big question is how well could canoes sail? And especially, could they sail upwind? Sailing upwind would allow canoes to make return voyages, and so they could go exploring and return with directions to new discoveries and planned migration could follow. But if they couldn't sail upwind and they couldn't return, one-way voyages downwind into the unknown, into the huge expanse of the Pacific Ocean, was quite a dangerous thing to do. And then there are other questions like the role of climate change and El Nino, which brings um, different winds, which can sometimes help. And there have been changing patterns of wind systems through time. Traditional canoes survived in some places well into the 20th century, as in Mailu on the Papuan coast of New Guinea. And this is a photograph from 1932. And this ethnography um, provides a lot of useful information. When I was a student, I was lucky enough to be able to sail on some of these canoes. And it was interesting to see how they use seasonal wind systems. The Māori people were traders, and they went west with the trade winds and came back east with the monsoon. And this is fairly typical of what sailors were doing all over the Pacific, making strategic use of the prevailing wind. This is a surviving canoe from the Kulurang um, that was made famous by Malinovsky's book Argonauts of the, of the Pacific. And there are still traditional canoes to be seen in some places. Thirty thousand years ago, Pleistocene hunter-gatherers reached the end of the Solomon's, Solomon's chain. Now, this is no surprise because some routes um, involved short water gaps and they were in intervisible most of the way back to mainland Asia. But when the route became blind, that's where they stopped. And then much later, with the arrival of Neolithic people in this part of the Pacific, around about by about 1300 BC, people with the Peter Pottery were well established in the Bismarck Archipelago, um, north of the Solomons, north of New Guinea. But they seem to have stopped at the intervisibility line for a couple of hundred years too. Coming through island Southeast Asia, they hadn't had to make long ocean voyages. So this was a visibility threshold for them too. And what I think is that for those 200 years of delay, they got some experience going east and west, backwards and forwards, with the trade wind and the monsoon. And then with their first offshore ocean voyage, they were able to cross to Santa Cruz and they could go out and back with the same winds. And that voyage was, a, was navigationally quite a simple voyage because they were sailing under the same zenith stars. So they could always return under the same sky as they went out. Now, the shading you can see in this um, diagram shows zones of intervisibility. And some of the, there's quite a lot of intervisibility through some of the um, island groups, but there were big water gaps uh, as well. And, and it, was, it was 850 kilometers across to Fiji. But once they started, they did it pretty quickly. And within about 200 years, they got to Samoa. And then there was another stop. And in fact, here, there was something called the Long Pause, which actually lasted 1,500 years or more. And the reason for this pause is people had reached the edge of the Pacific Plate. There were more easterly winds. The island targets were now smaller, and the distances were much greater. And so it looks as if technology had to change. Back in um, 1985, I had the opportunity to sail on a small yacht from New Zealand to New Guinea. This was a learning experience for me. And this is a picture of um, our small yacht anchored offshore and a couple of, um, couple of um, contemporary um, Massam canoes um, drawn, drawn up on the beach. Now, as we sailed across island Melanesia, 
we were sailing with the trade winds. It wasn't too hard. And I was aware that I was sailing along the track of Lapita, and I was wondering what it was like for them coming the other way. And after a while, um, it took a while for the penny to drop, and then I realised that what made it possible for sailors to search into the prevailing wind was that they could always turn around and go home. And there was a safety net of large islands downwind. So maybe the first rule of exploration is knowing the way home. So they could get home, but there were also winds for sailing east. There were winds that they could use that interrupted the prevailing trade winds to, to, to search out into the east. There was the northwest monsoon that blows intermittently across island Melanesia, and occasionally it blows beyond that into East Polynesia as far as Tahiti. And when Cook was um, on Tahiti in 1769, um, Tupaya, the navigator priest, um, told him about these winds, among others. And also you'll see that uh, down south of the tropics, there were traveling high pressure and low pressure systems. Well, they bring westerly winds um, that you can use for sailing east into the southern fringes of the tropics. And then there were also periods of increased El Nino, and there were also latitudinal shifts in wind systems and climate change that have been studied by Goodwin um, and others. And so there are various migration theories that hinge on particular wind systems. Now, I think that upwind sailing was the way it was done. But no, wind, no boat can sail directly into the wind. So the zone from 0 to 75 degrees from the wind here in this diagram is shown as no go. And the upwind argument is fairly modest. 75 degrees is enough upwind to be able to negotiate the seasonal winds, but could they do it? So this is where Richard Flay and the yacht engineers got involved to help us answer that question. Here are some sails in East Polynesia that were seen by early Europeans. They're all oceanic spritzels, and it turns out that the details of these um, early sketches and, and drawings are pretty unreliable. But we were very lucky in being able to have access to three sails of 18th century type that are held in the British Museum. <clears throat> the Maori sail is thought to have been collected by Cook in New Zealand, and there was also a Tahitian sail, and we were able to use these models of these sails in wind tunnel experiments. This is a Hawaiian or Marquesan sail. They were both very similar. And even though these East Polynesian sails are of different shapes, they're of the same basic type with um, two spars, uh, one with a, a leading spar and the other with a, a trailing spar that is, is used to trim the sail. And this is one of the um, graduate interns in the Yacht Research Unit, um, Filippo Monaro, who um, made a lot of models of different shapes of sails that were known historically, or, or the ones in the British Museum. And um, the sails are made of finely woven pandanus, and the spars are flexible bamboo. So here's one of the sails in the twisted flow wind tunnel, um, which in the past has been used to help design American yacht sails. So this is a two meter sail on a 2.8 meter um, hull. And this is a sail that was designed by um, Richard Nye. And we think that it's sort of a generic East Polynesian sail. And, and we, we call it the ancestral sail. Whether it was or not, um, we don't know. So here are some of the, the results. We're looking at the driving force of those four different sails. And the one we designed ourselves as an ancestral one is suitably the one that is performing uh, worst. But they're all performing in a fairly similar way, and that's not surprising because they're the same type. 
Now, to sail upwind, a boat must generate enough driving force in the right direction, but the side force of the sail must be matched by the hydrodynamic lift or side force that's generated by the hull. And so Richard tested these three models, hull models, in the towing tank at Newcastle University uh, when he was in Britain on leave. <clears throat> these are one-tenth scale models of 12-metre canoes. And one of them is a U-shape, and the other two are V-shapes, a medium V and a deep V. And they represent the extremes and the midpoint of the range of Pacific um, hull shapes. So even though we've only got hull data for three shapes, um, intermediate forms are probably along the, um, the the range of performances of these canoes. And this is the towing tank with uh, one of Richard's models. And he was able to show that V-shaped hulls generate more lift than U-shaped ones, and they sail better upwind. So at that point, we had measurements, and we had sails, and we had hulls. And then Dillis was able to provide us with some archaeological evidence um, of various canoes that um, she conserved and which were laser scanned. So we've got the three dimensional shape. And the one on the left is a reconstruction of the Anawika Waka um, canoe. And it looks as if it's pretty close to the um, modern um, V um, shape canoe. So we have a methodology for um, testing canoe performance, but it was really fortunate that we had an opportunity um, in a historical case to actually test it. Um, an anthropologist friend of mine, Fred Damon, um, took a voyage across the Masson of, that's at the eastern end of New Guinea, in 2002 in a traditional canoe a distance of um, about 225 kilometres, which he did in three legs. And Fred had a GPS with him, and he took his position off and along the, the way, and he wrote it up in a book in 2017. Now, this gave us a chance to simulate his voyage to test our methodology, and this simulation was done by another um, graduate intern in the Yacht Research Unit called Lachlan Dudley. So this was Fred's canoe. It's a moderate V-shape. It's not unlike the Anaweka Waka of New Zealand. And here is the canoe en route. And this is a photograph I took in 1980 of a, um, a Luxel. And so we were able to um, model both the hull and the sail. And so this is the model um, hull and, um, and lug sill that we derived from um, that information. And what was interesting about it was that um, there are parallels with um, sails and hulls from prehistoric New Zealand. Okay, the wind tunnel tests and the, and the um, towing tank tests produce a polar diagram of the velocity prediction for the virtual canoe. And this shows boat speed by wind speed by wind angle. And those curves of different colors are different wind speeds. The, the red wind speed is 10 meters a second, which um, translates as about um, 20 knots of wind. And at 90 degrees to the wind, that, um, that canoe is theoretically sailing at about six knots. So we then sent um, a canoe with that performance to sea and, um, and sailed at the same time as, um, as Fred's voyage. Um, the blue track is the real canoe. The yellow track is the virtual canoe. And Lachlan was able to store, was to use stored weather data um, from 2002 that's held in the Copernicus Climate Data Store. So both the canoes were sailing in the same weather. And the VPP performance um, was loaded into routing software. And this 
um, kind of software known as routing software. It's, a, it's available online and it's used by um, sailing boats to find optimal, optimal routes to a destination um, in terms of forecasted weather. So the virtual canoe was given a destination. It was given a, a weather report and it was the same, um, it was the same weather. And the two canoes took off at the same moment at 9.54 a.m. And one of them arrived, the, the real canoe arrived five minutes behind the five minutes behind the virtual canoe. The reason um, um, what actually happened was, was that um, the real canoe slowed down to pass through the fringing reef, whereas the virtual canoe naively arrived at full speed. But the um, the parallel is absolutely remarkable, and there must be a lot of must be some luck in there as well as um, good management. But on other legs of the voyage, um, the canoes both canoes were sailing upwind at um, 75 degrees, and it seemed to confirm that they could sail it. Okay, having done that test. The next step was to apply the method to prehistory. And what we have here is a reconstruction of the Anawiki canoe. <clears throat> the polar diagram on the left is that canoe sailing in a wind of four meters per second, about eight knots. And the diagram on the right is the canoe sailing in wind of 10 meters a second, which is about 20 knots. And you can see that both canoes are the top speed is when they're beam reaching with about 90 at about 90 degrees, but they're able to sail upwind um, at 75 degrees or more. So Lachlan then decided that um, now that he had the performance of the Anaweka Waka, he simulated the performance of the Anaweka Waka. He duplicated real voyages made by the famous replica canoe Hokalea, that was um, uh, based in the Polynesian Voyaging Society of Hawaii, and it made some famous um, experimental voyages around East Polynesia, where well, Lachlan sailed the Anaweka Waka around over the same tracks in the same weather. Um, we were able to um, simulate a voyage of the Hokalea from Samoa into the Southern Cooks, and that actually crossed over from that actually crossed over into East Polynesia, where the long pause was. And computer simulations by scholars including D. Piazza and Montenegro, Fitzpatrick and Callaghan have done simulations that show that improvements in technology were needed to make these voyages. Well, one of the improvements was the V-shaped hull that generated enough wind, enough lift to windward. And we can see that the canoes are following an erratic track, and that's because a trough um, is passing through, and it brought westerly winds with it that um, enabled the canoe to sail east. So the voyage began with an easterly wind, and then the wind went um, into the north, and then into the west, and then round to the south, and then finally it was back in the east, and the tracks respond to that changing direction as they try and climb up wind, but they were able to use that trough um, to get across the zone of the long pools. Okay, that was a, an East Polynesian canoe that um, um, dates back, say, a thousand years. We're now looking at a hypothetical Lapita canoe um, of um, 3,000 years ago, and we're doing um, some experiments that are using the same sails. We used an ancestral sail, which we thought was um, um, effective, but perhaps not the best one going. But the canoe, the canoe hull now has a round bottom. And our assumption is that early canoes were probably simpler and dugout canoes were more like the round, round shape of the trees from which they were made. So if we look here, we see something rather different from in the Polynesian canoe. On the left, at four metres a second, eight knots of wind, the canoe can go upwind, but it's marginal. On the right, in 20 knots, it can't sail above 90 degrees with some sails. 
So what's happening is that with more wind, the hydrodynamic lift of the hull can't compensate for the increasing side force of the sail. And that might be one of the factors involved in the technology that um, made a contribution to the length of the long pause. There must have been other factors as well. So our experiments lead us to two conclusions. The Peter was constrained to a narrow latitudinal range by its technology. But then somewhere more than a thousand years ago, settlement just exploded from West Polynesia into East Polynesia. And we think that involved the technological package of the Oceanic Spritzel, uh, which was found everywhere at European contact and, and linguistic reconstruction suggested was the sail which came into East Polynesia at the beginning. But more particularly, there are moderate V-shaped hulls, um, which are probably made by planking as well as being um, dugouts. And the third um, element, the technological element, was that there was the that people were now using double canoes and two hulls in a double canoe generate more hydrodynamic lift than a single hull with um, an outrigger. So this is where we are at the moment. Um, we think that Lapita canoes had marginal upwind performance and that contributed to the long pause whereas East Polynesian canoes could sail at wind and return and migrations could have been planned. In the case of New Zealand, um, the archaeological and genomic evidence is that there was a very substantial migration which occurred in a short period of time, and it would seem that those people were sailing to a known destination. So this work has come out of the conservation of archaeological canoes that um, Dillis has been doing, and it's um, all very interesting.